dad, as well as being the state's first Aboriginal teacher, went on to become the state's first principal. Len Hayward was born in 1929. Following the death of his mother, he was raised by his maternal grandparents in Broom Hill, Western Australia. At the time, Noongar people struggled to exist under the 1905 Aborigines Act, which enforced the segregation of Aboriginal people into reserves and settlements, and which controlled virtually every aspect of their lives. Those Aboriginal children granted access to an education were often removed from schools, following objections from non-Aboriginal parents who petitioned against their inclusion in classrooms alongside their own children. I was a young Noongar boy in a country school. He was allowed to attend with his sisters because his maternal grandfather, who was raising them after their mother died, uh, was well thought of in the, the district. So they were tacitly given community approval from the farming community to attend because of the high esteem with which their grandfather was held by those farmers. At school, Dad's academic potential was seen by a teacher who realised that to maximise the opportunities, the family was going to need assistance to send him away to high school. At that time, there were only two secondary schools in WA, Albany Senior and Perth Modern, that teacher. Mr Fowler, I think, might have contributed some funding as well, but he worked with Dad's grandfather to help save some money to cover boarding costs and things. The opportunities he got in Albany were exciting. Because he was academically talented anyway, school was fun. He could continue his sports that he enjoyed and he joined the Air Cadets, which was pretty amazing. At the time, the Education Department had a program where people who were considering becoming a teacher could work in a school for a year and get a sense of what the job was all about. Dad enjoyed that so much, he did it for two years, but then had to relocate to Perth to come to Teachers College. So another big move for a young native man under the scrutiny of native welfare and the local sergeants. While studying at Claremont Teachers College, Len met fellow student Grace Toy. They fell in love and upon graduating in 1951 were married. At a time when it was still considered illegal for interracial couples to marry, Len and Grace's union was an exceptional one. It was, however, not without government scrutiny. The context for Mum being a non-Aboriginal woman who married an Aboriginal man in the 1950s, she was an amazingly strong woman. But she also then came under the auspices of the Native Welfare Department, who, we found out later, would come to our house while we were all off at school and inspect the premises to make sure that we were being looked after appropriately. So Mum endured those inspections while we were off at school and we were oblivious to it. And I think that was a conscious choice that both Dad and Mum made not to tell us about the difficulties they faced. We were told later in life, when we were a little more mature and could handle our feelings. <laughs> I was lucky growing up, not only were both mum and dad teachers, but we all, all of us kids, my brothers and sisters and I, all went to the primary school where dad was a teacher. We all had dad as a teacher, generally in year six. The fact that he was such a popular teacher made life easy for us. So looking at how he taught, remembering his interactions with people, and the fact that that made every child, not only in his class, but in his school, love him and want to do well because of him, I think was a great lesson for me when I became a teacher myself. In year six, he was my teacher. And I saw how he, he uh, didn't have to work so hard with some of us because we understood the work and just got on with it. But I saw him take the time with students who found it harder to grasp the initial concepts. He wanted everybody to achieve well. He was no different to any other teachers of that era. He had to be firm when he had to be firm, but for others, he made adjustments as necessary. 
and I saw him doing that even when he moved out of a classroom role into being a deputy and then a principal. So as a school leader, he set high goals for students and encouraged them to achieve those high goals that he had for them. In his younger days, Len was a talented athlete. He went on to become a local football hero with the South Fremantle Football Club, following in the footsteps of his father and two uncles. Len continued his involvement with junior sports in a coaching capacity throughout his teaching career. His connection through South Fremantle Football Club was a long-term one, followed on from his father and two uncles. He had sporting talents that he was able to use, so while he excelled individually, he enjoyed the team spirit too. He brought that to his belief of how education for his students ought to occur. So he was into junior sports development. He assisted with inter-school sports teams at school and was part of the coaching and development staff for the state football teams. Children's minds, bodies and their spirit was his focus always. Lynn taught at many schools in Western Australia, later becoming Deputy Headmaster at several schools in the Perth metropolitan region. In 1979, he accepted a promotion that further cemented his place in Western Australian teaching history. We had all completed high school by the time Dad seriously pursued promotion. And that meant he was actually able to accept any promotion that was offered. When it was offered, it was at the Waluna Special Aboriginal School. Waluna's pretty remote. It was then and it certainly is now. But he was perfect for that role. He was perfect not only because of his own style as an educator and as a principal as well as as a person, but the community there could identify with him because of his Aboriginality. He was Noongar, they were not, but there was still that common bond. It meant that probably for the first time in Waluna's history, the community worked hard with the school for the betterment of the education of those children. And it meant that all kids came to school every day. They all showered at school. They got into school uniform at school. They were fed breakfast. They were fed lunch before they were taken home. Once again, Dad drove. There was a school bus. It was probably the state's first breakfast program in a school something that we see nowadays as being really important to encourage regular attendance. When you think about that being as long ago as it was, he was at Waluna in 1979, 80 and 81. That's groundbreaking in terms of not only trying new things, but trying things that worked and worked not only in terms of school attendance, but also participation and attainment. When Claremont Teachers College was closed in 1981, desktop salvage from the main lecture theatre were mounted as a display in the Education Faculty Building on ECU's Mount Lawley campus. Along with scores of other past students from Claremont, Len Hayward left his mark. You know, I was told about the desk I do remember the big lecture theatre. It had long benches. I had no idea that Dad had been that bored, <laughs> that he'd found time to leave his mark. But then I thought, yeah, that's just what he would have done. Left his mark and never discussed it with anybody else. It was only when someone discovered it for themselves that he'd have engaged in a conversation about it because that's just how he was. You didn't big note yourself or blow your trumpet too much. You just did what you did and if someone else found a connection with it then that was an opportunity for a conversation about it. But I'm reminded too that he was still under the scrutiny of the Native Welfare Authority so he could have risked it all but that devil may care attitude was there. Push the boundaries because that's where real change comes and you can do awesome things so yeah that was him. <laughs>